Well, good morning and welcome to the Japan Society's weekly Zoominar. My name is Bill Emmett and I feel privileged to share the Japan Society at this moment and to be able to bring together the best of thinking on these difficult and demanding times from both Japan and the UK. And in doing so, I'm very grateful, especially for the support of all our donors and members uh, to enable the Japan Society to bring together events of this sort. Last week, we looked at domestic politics, although Brexit, of course, reared its ugly head. This week, our topic is firmly international, concerning the so far relatively small, but sometimes highly controversial role that has been played by international collaboration and by international institutions in general. Should this role be bigger? And can it become bigger as the crisis evolves? What future tasks and risks need to be addressed by what we like to call the international community? My predecessor as editor of The Economist, Rupert Tennant Ray, tried to ban the use of that phrase, international community, in our pages, saying that it made it sound as if countries were taking in each other's milk deliveries. But these communities aren't always friendly, and certainly with Donald Trump in the White House, they aren't friendly now. To address these issues, we have two very distinguished pillars of the international community. In the UK, we have Mark Malak Brown, whose career passed twice through the doors of The Economist, but then moved to more glorious heights at the World Bank, as head of the UN Development Programme, as United Nations Deputy Secretary General, and then back to the UK as a foreign office minister in the government of Gordon Brown in 2006 to 2010, when he became Lord Malik Brown. And shortly thereafter, he wrote a memoir, which I shall hold up here, available on, in all good lockdown bookshops, but also on Amazon, called The Unfinished Global Revolution, The Limits of Nations and the Pursuit of a New Politics. We'll come back to that topic uh, a lot, I'm sure. And in Geneva, we have our old friend Mami Mizutori, whose career took her through many Gaima Show posts, including London. Then she left the Gaima Show to direct the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts in East Anglia, was also a board member of the Japan Society, I'm delighted to say, and for the past two years has been in Geneva as United Nations Special Representative for Disaster Risk Reduction. Her written work, notably, very notably, recently included a very robust and strong letter in the Financial Times, Investing in Prevention Pays Off and Saves Lives. I recommend it highly. We're going to have each of our speakers address us for 10 minutes, um, following which we will then move to discussion uh, and very much your Q&A, uh, which you can address to our speakers through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. We're going to start in Geneva with Mami Mizutori and then move to Mark. Mami, over to you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill, for the invitation to speak at this very important webinar series. Also, thank you for allowing me to speak first because it would have been too intimidating to try to say anything meaningful after Lord Mark Brown about the United Nations or international cooperation. At the end of last week's webinar, Bill, you said today's session is on the strange absence of international cooperation. And indeed, our Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, is speaking out strongly on the lack of global leadership and a common strategy to fight this pandemic. I joined the UN two years ago as head of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Our mission is to support member states to prevent and prepare better so that hazards do not turn into disasters. Now, I have learned that it is not really in our nature to act wisely before something terrible happens. It's not our first priority to put an extra pound for resilience. And now, Sadly, a biological hazard has become a global disaster with hundreds of thousands of people dead, millions in their houses or worse in the streets. And I will come back to this later and we'll first talk about what the United Nations is doing as a whole. Now this pandemic is a global health disaster in the first instance. WHO is at the forefront supporting member states regardless of their income level. 
Viruses do not need a passport to cross borders. So the response also has to be borderless and globally coordinated. The leadership, expertise, and guidance are with WHO, which has had the experience of fighting against smallpox, malaria, TB, Ebola, and many other diseases. This pandemic is also a global socioeconomic disaster. Some countries may be seeing the peak of growing infection and mortality, but the true magnitude of the socioeconomic impact is yet to be seen. COVID-19 does not discriminate who gets infected, but its impact does. It's hitting hardest the most vulnerable in the world's poorest countries, women, children, youth, senior citizens, migrant workers, displaced people, and refugees, persons living with disabilities, and the list goes on. Now, at the end of March, the UN launched the Global Humanitarian Appeal on COVID-19 for immediate humanitarian response. So far, half of what has been requested, $2 billion, has been provided. Then, towards the end of April, the UN made a call to scale up international support and political commitment to protect livelihoods, jobs, and businesses towards a safe recovery of societies and economies, and a trust fund has been set up. This week, in an op-ed in The Guardian, Sir Mark Lowcock, who is the head of the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs and previously Permanent Secretary of DFID, appealed that the cost to protect the most vulnerable 10% of the people in the world's poorest countries from the worst impacts of the pandemic is approximately 73 billion pounds, which is equivalent to 1% of global stimulus packages of the world's richest countries. Mark says that this is not only affordable, but necessary because we are only as strong as the weakest part of the world when dealing with a global challenge such as a pandemic. A threat to one of us is a threat to all of us, and we know this from dealing with international terrorism, migration uh, in the past. So we need to respond first and recover from this disaster, and it's crucial that we recover better. Back to normal is not enough. We have to flip this disaster into an opportunity to address fragilities, inequalities, gaps in social protection for a more sustainable, equal, and carbon neutral international society that should be our new normal. In particular, I want to say climate action must be embedded in the recovery from COVID-19. UK will be hosting COP26 next year. This is a very important COP because member states are expected to renew their commitment towards a carbon neutral world. We are not winning the race against climate emergency. In the past 20 years, 90% of major disasters globally have been related to climate emergency. These are hurricanes, cyclones, floods, heat waves, wildfires, droughts, affecting all countries, including UK and Japan, with more frequency and intensity than ever. And as we speak, the cyclone season in Asia is approaching. Cyclone Harrod has already wreaked havoc in the Pacific Islands. Now, imagine what will happen if a cyclone hits Cook's Bazaar in Bangladesh, where refugees from Myanmar are already under the risk from COVID-19. Disasters don't wait their turn to strike. We must brace ourselves for the danger that multiple disasters can happen during the recovery from COVID-19, and we must fight climate emergency in the longer term. This brings me back to what I do at the UN. My message is that in addition to responding and recovering better, we need to prevent better because prevention saves lives. Risk is my business, and our core mandate is to support member states, governments, central and local, but also the private sector, civil society, academia, and importantly, communities to reduce disaster risk, prevent better, and build resilience. How do we do this? Most importantly, we need to understand the feature of the risk we are facing. This is one of the first this is one of the four priorities of the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, which was adopted five years ago in Sendai, Japan. Sendai Framework is the global blueprint for disaster risk reduction 
and is the first of the many international agreements adopted in 2015, such as the Paris Agreement and Agenda 2030. Now, importantly, at the Sendai Conference, a lot of member states pushed for biological hazard to be included because they had experienced Ebola, MERS, SARS. So we knew that it was a risk, but whether we prevented, prepared enough is another story, and I think we know the answer. So the most important feature of risk in the contemporary globally connected society, what is it? It's the systemic nature of risk. This means that risks do not occur in silos. Risk is joined up and cascading. COVID-19 is a textbook example of a public health disaster quickly evolving into a global socioeconomic disaster. So as risk has become systemic, our response also needs to become systemic and not siloed. Risk reduction solutions have to be across sectors. And this calls for a stronger governance of risk and enhanced investment in resilience. The greatest driver of disaster risk is weak governance, lack of political commitment, lack of leadership to invest in prevention. And for stronger governance of risk, Governments should have a national and local strategy for disaster risk re reduction with all the hazards that they are facing included. This is one of the seven targets of the Sendai framework and the deadline to achieve this is actually the end of this year. But only 81 countries have such a strategy and none of them, well, a few of them only have biological hazards in them. So now we are supporting member states to have these strategies with biological hazards. But importantly, it's not enough to have a strategy. You have to invest in it for the budget and human resources against it. We have seen too many disasters where there is a lack of prior action. And we keep, up, we keep on picking up the pieces after the disaster. This has to change. We need to focus. We need to focus more on risk proofing our society. And how much would it cost really to secure the world against this disaster. Three years ago, the Commission on Global Health Risk Framework for the Future proposed measures to stave health disasters, including annual investment of 3.4 billion to upgrade national health systems, $1 billion for investment in research, and $155 million for the WHO to establish a dedicated center for health emergency preparedness and response. Now, is this a lot of money? Considering what is happening to the global economy and the trillions of dollars in the stimulus packages, I believe those sums are reasonable. So my last words are, I repeat, that we have to change this crisis, this disaster into an opportunity for governments, companies, but also each one of us to change our behavior, not to allow efficiency to become the paramount goal of what we do, and instead make risk-informed decisions and invest in them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mami, for a very, very inspiring uh, presentation that really does tell us that um, efficiency is actually probably one of the least efficient ways to uh, proceed. At least that's what we're discovering with the pandemic and the lack of preparedness that we've seen. Now, Mark uh, Malik Brown, he uh, bears the scars of many episodes of uh, international lack of collaboration or sometimes international uh, friction. Um, what's your perspective on uh, the role of international organizations and the situation we find ourselves in? Well, Bill, thanks. And I mean, what a strong presentation. And I think in a way it, it, it captures the dilemma of the UN. You've just spoken very powerfully and well. Mark Lowcock, as you mentioned, you know, spoke persuasively about the very large humanitarian needs in the developing world. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has actually been delivering you know, eloquent, thoughtful insights into the absence of international leadership. But UN figures, with the single exception of Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization, have been largely, frankly, invisible on the world stage, which is 
after all, more a judgment of news editors uh, than their own efforts. And I think the fact that, you know, what the Secretary General has to say about the crisis doesn't merit uh, much attention in the media reflects both the highly national leadership of this crisis. It is, you know, it's, it's a sort of vindication of Donald Trump's mantra of America first. It seems to be every country first. It's been a highly uh, nationalistic uh, led response at this stage. Um, and second, it does frankly reflect the erosion that began well before uh, this crisis of the global authority and, if you like, legitimacy of the international system. Uh, it's been a commonplace of editorials and comment pieces for some years now, even preceding the election of President Trump, that countries were becoming more bilateral, less multilateral, uh, more sort of winner takes all rather than uh, win wins multilateral solutions to global problems. So. You know, this crisis has come into an environment where we have a highly bilateralized moment uh, in global politics. I think, you know, to score the international system on the crisis so far, I agree with Bill's opening remarks, you know, a faulty first innings on the health side. Dr. Tedros and WHO have done an awful lot better than they've been credited with by uh, the White House. But, you know, this is tough stuff, calling the shots, understanding exactly what the epi epidemiology is telling you. And as one who's been involved in the management of similar, much less serious pandemic threats, both in the UN and then in national government in the UK, you know, we always think that epidemiology, you know, is a branch of the hard sciences. Uh, it's not, it's a world that Bill and I know better. It's really a branch of economics. Uh, it's a social science, it's a predictive science which uh, is always hard to call very accurately. And uh, in that sense, you, you know, the, the, the people working for WHO in Geneva face all the difficulties that national leaders do about the merits of lockdowns when, uh, the ability to sustain them, the prudence of wearing face masks. Around each of these, there is compelling, uh, confusing uh, evidence and debate. But I think the UN is likely, and the Bretton Woods institutions, to have, a, if you like, a much better second round, second innings to this crisis, when tragically it moves beyond being just a health crisis to a long-term economic and structural crisis. And in that sense, while there is quite a lot of confusion about the epidemiology of how hard this first wave is going to strike developing countries, for example, South Asia, 25% of the world's population, so far only 2% of the cases, uh, even in Africa, you know, very uneven impacts and it's very hard to know whether it was prudent quick lockdowns have led to this age structure uh, and experience of dealing with with communicable diseases in the past less urban settings uh, the nature of informal sector work there are all sorts of theories out there but i think it's much too cook soon to call whether they help whether they're just behind in the wave as developing countries and will catch up with Western numbers, or if they don't, will nevertheless be hit by a second wave. But where we can now predict with relative certainty is the economic impact. You know, over the last couple of months, the highest outflows ever uh, of, of funds from uh, emerging market economies, the collapse of commodity prices, most notably, obviously, uh, oil, the really significant public and private debt exposures that uh, a lot of developing countries have, the collapse of their export sectors. I, I'm very involved with Bangladesh. The garment sector just simply stopped uh, with a huge impact on employment in Dakar and its surrounding areas. The collapse in many parts of the world of remittance earnings being sent home, and in many cases, those workers actually having to go home instead. In Ethiopia, they're having to receive workers back from the Gulf countries, and it's proving a huge uh, challenge. If you look slightly longer term, the likely contraction 
of global supply chains to a more regional, uh, more resilient, less exposed base. I suspect a massive wave of automation uh, across manufacturing and service sectors everywhere. In the case of developing countries, it may not be automation of production there, but the repatriation of that production to Western economies. And then because of sort of social distancing and labor cost issues, uh, massive automation of those jobs uh, in the US and Europe. So dramatic changes ahead uh, in the global economy, its outlook, its structures. And there, I think we can anticipate to see a lot more inter active international engagement because simply it's going to overwhelm the global economy if it isn't handled in a more uh, sort of effective way. I thought it might be just quite useful to run through uh, I chair a thing and in fact founded 25 years ago was a founder of a thing called the International Crisis Group and as we've thought about this we do diplomacy and analysis around the conflicts in the world and advocacy around it you know we, we picked out seven themes that we or lenses that we thought that we immediately had to look at this situation through and the first that Mami touched on was the vulnerability of conflict affected populations she mentioned Cox's Bazaar and the Rohingyas but you know non-refugee populations already starved of health services by civil war at real risk places like Libya Venezuela the western area of Syria uh, Yemen uh, secondly, the whole damage to international crisis and conflict resolution mechanisms, everything from rather practical issues of envoys not being able to travel to major international initiatives like the Afghan peace talks being affected in all kinds of way by COVID, the Taliban skeptical of America's commitment if its troops are now also at risk uh, from COVID, uh, UN peacekeeping forces around the world unable to rotate troops in and out for fear that they become a vector for bringing in uh, COVID to the countries where they're working. Third, the, the huge risk to social order that we are, are starting to see it you know at the beginning there was an, an actually a great decline in street demonstrations from algeria to lebanon iraq even iran hong kong chile you saw a sort of suspension or postponement of social protests but you know that it's just a suspension and that the inequalities that fed them and issues that fed them are being aggravated uh, by this economic slowdown and so we'll come back uh, with a real push after this. The sort of fourth, the issue of the sort of political exploitation of crisis, how, you know, Hungary, for example, Prime Minister Orban has seized absolute powers, how in a country like Bolivia, an interim president is able to extend her rule, and, and many other countries from Poland to Sri Lanka, where there are doubts now about elections that are coming up and their ability to hold them. Fifth, you know, the huge impact on major power relations, the um, US absence of leadership, whether it's in the G20, you know, financial packages for, for the global economy, whether it was on Monday at the meeting to raise monies for vaccines uh, held in Brussels by Ursula von der Leyen, um, the fight that the US has engaged in with WHO, and correspondingly on the other side, the rise of China, with its, if you like, sort of humanitarian COVID diplomacy, the delivery of masks and ventilators uh, to many countries around the world. But, you know, while it's actually having a good crisis, even though it began in Wuhan, um, the, the, you know, it's not an alternative leadership to the US. What one's seeing rather is an unled world rather than, you know, a replacement of one G1 by another G1. And, you know, in that sense, I think, um, you know, we are at a moment of huge uh, difficulty. And so the last two opportunities or and crisis mitigation that the crisis group saw and which will, I will close with is just um, this feeling that the world is entering into an extraordinarily difficult period in terms of geopolitical leadership, in terms of economics and jobs, uh, in terms of the other linked long-term threats like the response to climate change that Mami mentioned. And you know, in that context, 
it's almost inconceivable to believe that the sort of America first or Britain first or Japan first uh, politics that has got us through this immediate pandemic phase in such a sort of limping, uneven way is sufficient uh, to the challenges that lie ahead. So while I don't want to hold up a crystal ball to what's going to happen in politics, because I think, you know, actually the range of countries that have done well don't break easily on. It's not that authoritarian countries have done better than democracies or democracies better than authoritarian. It's good governments have done best, whether they are in Taiwan or Germany, uh, you know, South Korea or Norway. Uh, and, you know, they've included some significant emerging country successes. Ramaphosa has had a good crisis so far in South Africa, um, you know, as has the uh, Vizcaya in, in Peru. So it's a very sort of odd set of winners. But what they've all had is sort of disciplined, systematic response. And that kind of, if you like, sort of science-based, evidence-led response takes you inevitably to a kind of model of global cooperation to start with, to deal with the issues of restarting our economy, of building back better uh, in terms of addressing not just the risks of a pandemic of this kind, but the linked risk of climate change crises in the future. So while it's been a grim bad start for international organizations and multilateralism, I think the nature of the threats that lie immediately ahead will pull us back together. And I expect national elections will deliver verdicts on those governments which have chosen to both go it alone and do it badly. And so I suspect as we enter 2021, we'll have a really troubled global economy, but the beginnings of a more coherent international response to that. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much, Mark. Likewise, a very, very uh, penetrating and, um, and uh, inspiring uh, um, uh, presentation, um, especially ending up with that uh, very optimistic and positive sense of uh, don't waste a good crisis, really. Um, I would inter interject that uh, uh, my own personal compliments to the International Crisis Group, who I've always found over the years as a journalist have been admirable uh, group to to deal with because of their analysis, but also their, also their advocacy, and I recommend them to our members very warmly. Um, now we in in we now move on to questions, and please do uh, audience submit your questions through the Q and A function, and I will uh, ask uh, present as many of them as I possibly can. Um, perhaps to both of you to start things off, Mammy and and Mark. Um, now it's often said that uh, cynically that. Um, uh, citizens get the, get the governments that they deserve um, in, in democracies? Do governments get the international organizations that they deserve? In other words, is the, are the, are the, can, what can international organizations do to actually goad governments to prepare better, to, uh, to influence better, and not to cut funding from the WHO in the way they are? Are you largely passive followers or can you kick back? Um, I'll start with, uh, with uh, me and then on to Mark, who's done a lot of kicking back in his time. So, um, can you hear me? Yes? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, so that's a, that's a very um, um, crucial question because when we say United Nations, um, United Nations is, is really about the member states. United Nations is about 193 member states um, who come together and make decisions, whether it's at the General Assembly or the Security Council. And myself and all others, international uh, civil servants, uh, we uh, support the member states. Um, we have the convening power, we advocate, and we are politically neutral. Um, and point is, unless there is a strong leadership coming from the member states uh, to uh, tell uh, the system ourselves uh, to do this or do that or advocate more for that, um, it becomes really Im impossible, I think, to achieve uh, many uh, things. Uh, so, um, uh, so I think that's what is the nature of the United Nations. And 
trying to answer your question, um, is the international organization uh, is only, you know, gets uh, as good as, you know, uh, what the countries are? Um, I think um, probably yes. And in that sense, um, I do feel that um, uh, that is where Antonio Guterres is really, really struggling now. He's calling for leadership because as much as uh, him or Tedros, uh, we try to um, ex exercise our leadership, the real leadership lies in the member states. Mark? Well, I you know, basically agree completely with that. That is, you know, that is the anchor, that's the ball and chain which holds back international uh, organization leaders from, if you like, doing better. I think there is a margin available to the best ones to, you know, exceed uh, what their government owners and masters would want them to do. And, you know, there is about the, the, the Office of Secretary General, a long-standing sort of uh, joke on the name, which is that some secretary generals are more secretary than general, and every now and again you get one who's more general than secretary. And you know, Kofi Annan is probably the outstanding example of 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 the one who is more general than secretary of recent years. And you know, he, he at that particular moment, which was an, a gloriously easy moment to sort of push push up the door and push your way into a more ambitious vision because it was post-Cold War, it was the era of economic globalization and integration, massive improvements in, in economic lives of many people around the world. You know, in that internationalist moment, he was adept at using the pulpit of the office to appeal to peoples over the heads of their governments. In fact, he always used to say that the Charter begins with we the peoples, not we the nations of the United Nations or we the states of the United Nations. And so, you know, that was a deliberate, almost Reagan-esque effort to sort of build a constituency beyond government leaders. And for him, it worked incredibly well because it then gave him enhanced authority to intervene with those government leaders. I mean, it was working for him as his deputy and before that chief of staff, it was you know, extraordinary to see there wasn't a world leader who didn't take his phone call very quickly. Uh, Secretary generals before and after, you know, get fended off by the foreign minister or the ambassador in um, you know, the country, uh, the country's ambassador to the UN. So you, you can build that. And if you take WHO, there was a legendary, fabled leader of WHO, of Grohal and Brundtland, uh, still alive um, and very active, but who, you know, had been a prime minister of Norway, was a medical doctor before that, brought huge authority to the job, and, you know, handled an early pandemic um, at the beginning of this, this century in, in a very effective, hands-on way. What do governments react to that? They choose weaker leaders, whether it was the successor to Kofi Annan at the UN or uh, to Gro Harlem Brundtland several, several director generals ago at WHO. You know, governments are very uncomfortable at an unleashed international system which gathers authority to, to itself and is not so dependent on them. So. I come back to echoing the earlier answer. Yeah, these systems are very limited by what governments will allow them to do. And at the moment, they reflect all the weaknesses of the, the level of disorder and conflict in the geopolitical system. Thank you. And now, um, I mean, specifically on the WHO, since you, Mark, mentioned that and, uh, and it's been uh, mentioned also by Mammy, I mean, Nicholas McLean has sent in a question how serious do you think is President Trump's threat to cut the US contribution to the WHO? Was it just rhetoric or is it actually being carried through? Uh, I mean, Mark, do you, in your experience, do you find these threats that tend to be carried through? And what, what, what would happen? What will happen, as it were? How do, you, how do you map forward the future of the WHO? Well, I probably, at the risk that you're going to accuse me of using this session to promote all my NGO interests, I probably uh, should declare that I also co-chair an organization called the UN Foundation, and we have raised largely in the US 
$200 million in the last few weeks for the World Health Organization and are in the front line in Washington of trying to both understand and respond to President Trump's threat to defund. There's no doubt at the moment it's a very serious threat. You know, people are working on it. They're trying to set conditions which range from Tedros's resignation to some kind of international investigation of WHO's performance, and while they're at it, the origin of the virus. Um, all of which I think will be unacceptable to the rest of the international community who actually, you know, I don't think many people give the WHO an A grade, but there are an awful lot of people who would give it a B grade uh, in, in terms of its response and know how much worse we'd be without it. Uh, and so, you know, I don't think he's going to carry other governments with him. I mean, the Brits stepped up and I, I imagine Japan did too. I don't know, with an extra contribution to WHO subsequent to President Trump's threats. So, you know, I, my feeling is that, and I see this from our fund, that corporate America and citizen America remains stolidly behind WHO. The rest of the world remains behind WHO. I think everybody, once the crisis is over, will want to look at how it can be made more effective and stronger, but not now. Um, and so I think whether the US withdraws will depart, depend entirely on whether President Trump is re-elected, um, because these withdrawals take time. Uh, and you know, I, I would anticipate that a democratic administration would go quietly right back in. Um, if Trump continues, I would not be surprised to see this as part of a kind of campaign which is anti-China, anti-international organization, and therefore becomes a core part of his second mandate uh, if he is elected. So, Mammy, um, you can, uh, by all means, comment a bit further on the WHO. Um, uh, yes, cool. uh, Bill. Um, I, I certainly hope uh, that um, um, the, the threat will not become a reality. And the reason is, um, it is true that uh, there are um, some um, issues at the United Nations which are quite political, uh, even the climate emergency issue, isn't it? But should a public health um, agenda uh, be political, it shouldn't, um, because uh, this is about the safety of every person in every country, wherever it is. And WHO is the only organization which has the global, the regional, and the national network uh, with a legal foundation. And that's how, uh, whether it was um, uh, timely or not, we found out that what was happening in, in Wuhan, because the countries have an obligation to report to WHO what is happening in these terms of um, health um, matters. Uh, so uh, there's, there's, as many people have said, um, no other organization can take over what WHO is doing. Um, and the other thing I would say is that, you know, it's um, as uh, Lord Mark Brown said, um, Japan, uh, UK uh, stood up and they funded uh, WHO, but it's not only that. Remember Lady Gaga, she created a concert, didn't she? With a start-studded uh, concert and uh, in just one day, uh, got um, uh, millions of millions of dollars for donation. So I think people understand what, why WHO is there and what it needs to do. Excellent, well, I hope so. And one of my neighbors here in Ireland is Bono. I don't know whether we should, maybe I should knock on his door and I suggest he does a concert as well. Um, now Nicholas McLean has further asked about uh, risk and best practice um, that, that perhaps you might address. It says, Mami, you spoke of risk being joined up and cascaded. Do you agree that best practice in the face of pandemic should also be joined up and cascaded? So if the policy response in South Korea, Germany, New Zealand, and some others clearly saves lives and livelihoods, can much more be done by the UN to move other countries in the same direction? How do you think about that issue of best practice and teaching others? Yeah, well, um, I can't agree more with, than uh, what Nicholas said, because what needs to be done um, after, but even during these kind of um, crises is learning from others, uh, best practice, but also practices that didn't work. Um, and the, the, I do sincerely feel that um, uh, we knew what was happening uh, first in Asia, um, and in some countries, um, including uh, South Korea, they were doing a very good job of uh, tracking down, um, testing, and whatnot. Um, 
Did we uh, try to learn quickly enough from the best practice? Probably not. So that's a lesson learned for those who didn't. And this is essential. Uh, for disaster risk reduction, what we do a lot is compile the lessons learned and best practices and share it. And that's another role that UN can do because we can do it in a neutral way. We're not doing it because it's a practice that comes from country A or country B. We find out what is the best practice and we share it. So uh, yes, absolutely, Nicholas. Excellent. Now, uh, um, Yuichiro Nakajima has uh, put it in a slightly pessimistic question about uh, a world with Messrs. Trump, Xi, Orban, Bolsonaro, and others in power, putting the UN in an impossible position. Um, do we have to wait for national elections to remove these leaders before the UN regains its stature and power? That's this is a question to Mark. I mean, the UN through its uh, history has always had some rather uncooperative uh, powers, particularly during the Cold War. Um, how can, and the UN cannot wait until regime change happens. <laughs> um, uh, it has to deal with the world that, it, that exists. How, do you, how, how, does, how does the UN think about that? And how can the UN work in that uh, environment where you have such hostile uh, leaders? Well, look, I mean, I think it's a very pertinent question and it's the one that really has shaped this uh, environment in which the UN has been so little heard during this crisis that, you know, the momentum has appeared to be with leaders of that kind, if you like. And, you know, if you add them up and, you know, chuck in a couple of others, Erdogan, Putin, a few more, you know, a huge majority of global citizens today uh, live in governments that are led by people who are, if you like, more nationalist, more authoritarian uh, than those who came before them. Uh, and, you know, that has shaped global politics in, in recent years. And, you know, it was a little bit sort of, you know, I, I sort of anticipated in my book, which is why I felt I couldn't cheer the success of an international system because, you know, you could see as the global recession began um, in 2009-10, you could kind of see where this was likely to go of, you know, a massive redistribution of wealth, which was going to create pockets of global outrage and instability at the injustice of the way elites had dealt with the aftermath of the financial crisis and that, you know, people were going to come to power who, who reflected that outrage. And I think broadly, that is what we have seen. But now we have a new crisis, which is going to deliver a new message. And, you know, I think, you know, it's going to be a message which is going to be of a much more progressive, engaged kind. So, yes, it will take elections before a lot of these leaders change. I mean, Bolsonaro is in terrible trouble at the moment in Brazil from having fired a couple of ministers in the last week, but nobody's anticipating a successful impeachment move, for example, against him, even though it's been talked about. But, you know, in general, these leaders will serve out their terms. But, you know, with the American election in November, I think we're going to get a first clear signal of the mood and temper of the world. Because if you see a change of leadership there, I suspect others will go down. And even before they go down, will be a lot more muted and less strident uh, in their leadership of this. So I think you'll see a little bit like a tanker t turning slowly, you know, global politics shifting direction, not decisively and forever, because I think this debate of nationalism versus international engagement is going to be with us for decades to come. It is the great if you like, organizing idea of, of, or, or choice of modern politics. But, and so in that sense, I don't think the UN is suddenly going to enter great sunlit era where everybody is suddenly a UNer. -er. Um, it's always going to be contested, it's authority challenged, but I think it's headed for calmer waters than what we've seen recently. Well, that's an optimistic view. And um, that's Mammy uh, leading on from that. I mean, we are going to move into a, a period where it, the economy and the social consequences of it, as you both said, are going to take over as, it were, as, the, as the primary issue. Uh, and um, in that time, uh, resilience and spending money for resilience becomes a crucial issue. 
Simon Shelton has asked, you know, how can the value of resilience be quantified to allow governments to make better allocation of resources? Uh, to add to that question, how can you, or what will you do just to say to governments during this period to say, in this time of incredibly stretched public finances, of vast unemployment, of huge bills for all sorts of things, um, how, can, how can I persuade you to actually spend a bit of money on risk reduction and uh, dealing with resilience? Will that, will that be an, a, a receptive audience, do you think? It's a, it's a tough audience, to be honest, um, but uh, there are already quite a lot of studies um, by um, institutions, um, organizations like the World Bank, talking about the cost benefit, the business case about investing in resilience. So, uh, for example, to give you uh, um, one example, last year the World Bank um, issued a report about investing in resilience in infrastructure building. Now there's going to be uh, uh, more than $90 trillion uh, of new investment in infrastructure between now and 2040. And if we are not going to make the infrastructure resilient, then we are creating more risk. And the report says that every $1 more that you put into the infrastructure will uh, benefit by $4 during the lifetime of the uh, infrastructure. Uh, it's based on a really, you know, a rigorous study of um, thousands and thousands of cases that World Bank has invested. So it's out there. The problem is, Bill, um, political leaders very rarely look beyond the horizon of their elected, you know, um, time. Um, you may uh, invest in resilience. Um, but um, you might not see the, the positive side of it uh, 10 years later when you're not the prime minister or the mayor of a city anymore. And this is, what, this is the problem. And that's where we say that you need leadership, you need true leadership, uh, saying that, okay, uh, maybe I put this in, uh, but then maybe I'm not gonna see the effect of it while I'm still in my post, but this is for the safety of my people. So um, that's the argument we do also with um, the um, scientific evidence. And um, that's why we keep on saying that we need leadership to do it and it's strong governance to do it. And do you think this is a follow up in this crisis so far? And I, I admit it's a short time because really this is the amazing thing about this crisis that it seems to have gone on forever. And yet it's actually only barely two, two to three months old. Um, is there enough evidence as to the question of the, whether countries that actually spent money on resilience then did better or can it still be attributed partly to random factors and luck? Uh, do, do we have enough data and, and evidence? Well, as you say, uh, we're still in the middle of a crisis, so we don't have enough data, but why did uh, Republic of Korea do so well? Because they experienced they experienced SARS. Uh, they were one of the few countries uh, which had mortality because of that. So that's when they decided that, yes, we have to learn from this and we have to build a system. The system that um, ROK was able to um, uh, use um, wasn't uh, made um, just um, um, night by day. They had already put in a system uh, so that they can track and they can test. Uh, so um, I think, you know, this is a great example of, yes, um, if you learn from your experience and if you invest, it pays off. It's only one example, uh, but I'm sure that, you know, we will see uh, more, uh, more examples while we go ahead and the opposite as well. And um, our job is to bring all that together and objectively, but uh, accurately um, projecting it. Bill. Mark, yes. Can I just, I mean, one observation, I, I would just, a prediction perhaps, that in the same way that the word austerity became the motif word post the financial crisis, and with it the implication of a kind of, how is the burden of pain shared, and it proved to be shared very unequally. Um, I think 
the motif word of post-COVID is likely to be resilience. And, you know, what does resilience imply? Shared burdens, uh, solidarity, uh, you know, community over sort of individual enrichment or whatever. And so, you know, I, I, I think in the terms of political culture, you know, the lesson that's going to get drawn from this crisis is very different to the 2009-10 financial crisis. Good point. Good point. Now, that, I think uh, I would agree with you at this stage. I think that, that's right. Now, um, the, a question where it leads towards the private sector here, which I I can follow from that. Yoko Dochi of SoftBank has asked, under the UN Principle for Responsible Investment, ICGN issued a statement to listed companies in the world to prioritize employment over dividends and shareholder returns. This will impact corporate behavior. Does this perhaps suggest another way for the UN to affect the way the private sector navigates post COVID-19 more sustainably? Do you have any thought about this? Is it practical and possible and, and helpful for the UN to influence private sector behavior in this direction of resilience? And do you, Mark and Mammy, start with Mark, think that its resilience is going to be where the, the corporate mantra for the future or word replacing efficiency? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think at least it's going to get rebalanced. Uh, I, I think a poorer consumer after the crisis is not going to accept a huge resilience premium in every good and service they, they pay for. They're not going to be able to afford it. But I think, you know, it, it will rebalance. And I think the UN, through UNPRI, the Principles of Responsible Investing, uh, through the UN Global Compact, through others of these mechanisms, is very much part of the conversation about shifting it. But I think you know, what's most compelling is that for investors, there is emerging evidence that actually countries that, uh, companies that prioritized originally their ESG um uh goals but now in the crisis their employment goals you know seem to do better uh they do better in sort of holding on to their different stakeholders from customers to employees to shareholders and so you know i think there has been a strange shift in market signals towards prioritizing companies which are more purpose-driven, more devoted to their communities, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, that is obviously part of resilience. Uh, it's companies acting in a more long-term way, if you like, to preserve their social and economic capital and thereby their economic capital. And, and so, yeah, I think there's something important happening there. Mammy, um, just uh, passing on to you on the same issue, but I'm going to supplement it with a really direct you towards governments in this response, response in, in um, the way they think and, and work, at least about, about resilience and about planning. Martin Barrow has asked, said, Mammy, you mentioned the key challenge of silos, tatawari gyose in Japanese, which he often talks on. Why can't governments and business and academia come together so that, for example, in the UK cannot be a parallel committee to COBRA bringing together all sectors? Do you find in working with governments that this silo mentality uh, is an obstacle? And do you think that there's a chance that that could at least be adapted in the future? Uh, it is an obstacle. Um, and the reason is, so a lot of governments have what is called uh, National Disaster Management Agency. Um, but uh, usually the case is it's not a very well-funded agency, it's not very re well-resourced, and it's not very connected uh, with other ministries. So to give you an example of the COVID-19, uh, we found out, um, sadly, that a lot of these national management, disaster management agencies were not really connected with the national health uh, servants, service agencies. Um, and this is what Martin says is Tatewari Yose, the siloed thing. Um, what we are advocating for is that these agencies, um, the national disaster management ones, need to be uh, more connected within the government. It has to be close to the highest political leader, whether it's the prime minister's office or the president's office, but also 
um, it's not enough to give just budget to this single agency. All the ministries in their different sectors need to have disaster risk reduction related budget in what they do. Um, and that's um, uh, what we um, hope that we will see more. And also uh, the need for all the stakeholders to come together is important. The same day framework for disaster risk reduction, it's not a legal document like the Paris Agreement. But what is uh, important is that it says that it's the whole of society's responsibility to mitigate disaster risk. So all the uh, sectors come together and that's um, how we do disaster risk reduction. Um, and I should say that um, the corporate sector is doing quite well. Um, they know that it's important for their business. Uh, they know that now in a world where the supply chain goes on forever in different countries, um, where disasters are happening um, all over the place, that they really need to invest in it. Sometimes I feel that they might be better than governments, some governments, in understanding the importance and in really investing it. It's happening. So um, I'm hopeful. And um, we also have our own um, network of um, uh, resilient um, uh, private companies, which are becoming more and more vocal. Um, so uh, there's hope there with the private sector. Thank you. Now, Stephen Gomesall has asked um, a very big question, which I'll put to you both um, and introduce it with the, the final paragraph of Mark's uh, fine memoir. Um, but Stephen Gomesall has asked, what changes or additions could be made to the international system to make it more effective in an age of great, greater nationalism? That's obviously a very big question, but I'm, it gives me an opportunity to read out the final paragraph of, uh, of The Unfinished Global Revolution by Mark Malik Brown says, Sometime in future, we will pause and look back at the feverish years of writing agreements to reduce poverty, regulate banks, and fight terrorism. We will see in retrospect how a new set of commitment among people, states, and international institutions came into being. When we look back, we will see the revolution. These were words from Mark that uh, said, don't expect a big bang and everyone sits down together and changes everything, but rather that bit by bit, the revolution will be built. What are the steps, first Mark and then Mami, that you would hope to see out of this crisis? Well, first to be premature to look back yet. Yes. <laughs> it's going to need a few more years, unfortunately, uh, caught in a premature optimism, I think, in my final paragraph. Um, but, you know, I'm seeing it, I mean, for example, at the moment, we have a situation where the capacity of emerging markets to create a monetary and fiscal response to this devastating depression style economic situation they face is running at a couple of percentage points of their GDP. GDP, whereas in developed countries it's running at anything from 10 to 30 percent of GDP. The IMF particularly but also the World Bank and the regional development banks have to be uh, allowed to size their response proportionately and so far they've been able to do much more than normal. The IMF has got 103 I think it is emergency programs that it's racing through but it's not been allowed to expand the quantum of monetary resource through a huge issuance of SDRs for example as some have argued for. So I think you're going to see a huge before this is through expansion of the financial capacity of the IMF and the Bretton Woods system more generally. And then at the UN end, as these humanitarian and social and uh, environmental consequences play through, I think bit by bit, you'll see strengthening of the climate change mechanisms in order to make them, if you like, more, more, more compulsory uh, for, for countries to abide by and stronger in their monitoring of country performance. So it'll be bit by bit in response to the different dimensions of this crisis. But I would anticipate five years from now, the system will look enhanced, even if politics out there still remains a choppy business with pockets of nationalism still sniping back at that. Thank you, yes, I think I do. I feel resonance in that, uh, the sense of the strengthening of the obligations, especially, and the ability of, 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 of organizations to monitor. Mami, your uh, final words, really. We have two minutes left, so. Yes, thank you, Bill. Uh, you last thank you. Um, it's a big question, so I might um, try to um, answer, not in a big way, but um, um, I guess it really um, uh, depends on how 
again, going back to what um, Mark said, we the people, how the people are going to um, uh, think differently, hopefully, and think, okay, what is the kind of progress that we want? Um, because until now, as much as um, progress and growth has um, elevated everybody's life and poverty is diminishing, uh, thankfully, it has also created a lot of, uh, again, risks in our societies, uh, whether it's climate uh, or whether it's a lack of uh, loss of biodiversity or whatnot. Um, and um, this is a time when the people, um, and especially I would say the young people, uh, I would hope, are going to um, think, okay, uh, we want a different kind of growth. We want a different kind of progress. And for that, uh, we would want the um, international um, uh, system, not only the UN, but uh, all of other um, bodies, to focus on the issues uh, that will really um, uh, ensure sustainability, will ensure equality. Um, I do believe that the young people are going towards that, um, and I do have hope in that. And uh, one thing that um, I've been um, learning um, since working for the UN is that you have to be optimistic to work at the UN because um, as Mark was saying there's a lot of um, uh, difficulty right now in the multilateral system uh, but um, I think that um, it's going to be a bottom-up process and bottom-up not only from uh, the governments but uh, from the people and from the young people especially. Um, this crisis has really taught us that uh, we are so vulnerable. Everything is connected, so one virus that starts from Wuhan can really uh, take us all down together. Um, and, um, and so uh, the international system has to be prepared for it, but it's, it's about you know, what kind of international system, what kind of um, um, agenda we, they want, the people want us to focus on. So um, I have hope in that, and I think um, uh, we will come out um, towards that um, new normal, I hope. Well, thank you to you, Mami Mizutori, and to you, Mark Malik-Brown. It's been a very, very optimistic and inspiring talk amid, amid difficult times. Uh, we are in the early stages of this process and this crisis, and it would seem to me to be extraordinary if, out of such a global issue, we, didn't, we failed to find some ways to improve the way in which global organization and global collaboration uh, happens, since there's such a clear interest for all countries in, uh, in uh, benefiting from that and sharing in it. And as, as Mark said, the resilience is perhaps the, uh, the word of the future. So I thank you both for your uh, fine contributions. I thank all the questioners for their questions. Sorry, apologies as usual for those whose, are, whose questions I failed to get to, but I, I note them all down and we'll try to use them in the future. Next week, we move on to the epidemiology, uh, or at least back to the epidemiology, really. We're asking Dr. Kiyoshi Kurokawa from the University of Tokyo and, uh, and a former uh, advisor to the Japanese government, and Peter Piot, director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a very notable uh, researcher and activist on uh, Ebola and on AIDS, um, for their view on, in effect, the answer to the question, what do we know now about the epidemiology, which as Mark has rightly suggested, is as much a social science as a hard science. But thank you to all of whom who listened, to thank uh, and watched, to your, for your support to the Japan Society, and thank you above all to Mami Mizutori and Mark Malak-Brown for sharing your time with us today. Thank you, and have a good week. Thank you.